Welcome everyone to this final session of the 2013 Virtual National Training Workshop. Our uh, session this afternoon is by Richard Brzezowski from Maine AgriBility. He's going to be talking about uh, methodologies for selecting and evaluating proper uh, types of enterprises for people with disabilities or other limitations. Before we get started, in case you have not yet memorized this list, looks like everybody on the call has been on uh, one of these presentations before, so I won't go over all the specifics again. We do encourage you to uh, either type your questions in the chat window or uh, raise your hand and ask your question verbally. I believe Richard's going to be asking for some of your input in the chat window at the beginning of his presentation, so please be prepared to share your thoughts there. Of course, we will be doing our survey questions at the end and archiving the recording. If you have technical problems, either use the chat window or use the agribility at agribility.org email address. Again, please uh, hang on if we get disconnected or reconnect if you are disconnected. And I think from looking through the attendance list, looks like everybody is pretty familiar with AgriBility already, so I won't go over the specifics. I will remind you of the all-staff call next Tuesday. And I should be getting an email reminder tomorrow with an agenda outline, so please remember to join us next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So Richard Brzezowski is uh, an Extension Educator with University of Maine Cooperative Extension. He's been with AgriBility for several years, and uh, I know many of you already know him, so I will turn things over to Richard and uh, disconnect my camera and microphone, and he can connect his, and then I'll plan to return at the end for our poll questions. Hi, everybody. It's cold here in Maine, and hope it's a, a, a nice day where you are somewhere in the country or the world. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Um, today, we're going to be talking or addressing the issue of um, selecting and evaluating uh, farm or ranch enterprises for individuals with limitations. So I want to start with an analogy, and I want you to uh, participate in this analogy. Um, we're talking about selecting. So how is choosing a meal from a restaurant menu like selecting a farm enterprise? Or what do you consider in selecting uh, a meal from a menu? Why don't you use the chat box and see what uh, people have to say. So go ahead and type in what, what drives you to choose something from a menu. Price. Price is one of them. Something that you like, maybe the taste taste of it. How hungry you are, you know. How big of a portion you're going to select. Now, how how uh, lovely is it? How what's it presented like in the menu? The quality of the food as well could be involved. Great ideas. Keep them coming. If it sounds good, okay. <laughs> if the uh, dish sounds good. So appeal, price, healthiness, you know, what's, what's, what's in, included in the, uh, in the uh, menu or in, the, in that dish, what the server is suggesting, you know, what's, what's the best, what's today's special? The picture in the menu, yeah, sometimes uh, the pictures look great, sometimes they don't look so great. The menu, pictures, the type of restaurant, okay. Okay, good. We've got lots of lots of uh, people typing in different things. So just like when you select um, a, something, uh, a meal from a menu, uh, choosing and evaluating an enterprise for a farm, you're going to have some things that drive you um, to to make those selections. So what, as a farmer, or someone that's advising a farmer, um, you want to ask them to prioritize what drives their decision. So. Price came up immediately in our 
in our discussion about what, you know, one of the things that you consider in ordering something from a menu. Well, you know, cost is going to be something that the farmer wants to consider for sure in deciding that enterprise as well. So we're going to take a look at uh, lots of different considerations um, in choosing and evaluating whether a, an enterprise is suitable for a farmer or rancher. So first of all, there's some basic types of enterprises, you know, some that you grow in the ground, like plants, so vegetables and fruits, herbs, flowers, um, Christmas trees, those are plant-based enterprises. Animal-based enterprises would be any kind of livestock or dairy operation, poultry, um, fish. Uh, so th you, know, you can divide them into animal-based, plant-based. What a lot of people don't think about too much is the service-based enterprises that farmers um, implement on their farms. This could be agritourism, or it could be cutting firewood, or delivering firewood, or welding, or uh, trucking. Um, so uh, bed and breakfasts, so all these things are service-based too. So a farmer, a farm family or a ranch family ought to think about you know, what fits on their land and what type of, of um, enterprise they want to select. So animal-based, plant-based, or service-based. And then besides that, you might want to say, well, what can I add value to of what I produce? So if you're an apple grower, you, know, you can sell the raw apples to people uh, by the bushel or by the bag or half peck or whatever. Or you could be making apple pies or, or um, fritters or, or something, some other added value. So you, think, you need to think about that in any of these enterprises, not just the plant-based one, but the service as well as the animal-based enterprise. You think about adding value. So looking at an enterprise by the basic type is one way to select. Another uh, consideration is how, how big of an enterprise um, should this be? You know, the size of it, the scale of it. Um, how, um, how much land you're going to need for that enterprise or, or space would be uh, also uh, important to consider. And then another area to consider would be the workload itself or the type of work that you're going to be a uh, asked to do or required to do for this enterprise to be successful. So you can see on the screen that I've broken into a, a, a little couple different ways of work. you got your physical work or manual labor. And so how many hours a day will this enterprise uh, involve? Um, what degree of uh, stra strain is needed? You know, uh, is it going to be hard work, easy work, heavy lifting, um, automated, whatever. Um, so your physical work and is going to need to be considered. Manual work, uh, machine work too would be uh, essential. Um, most farms have equipment on them. So whether it's tractors or farm implements or other labor-saving tools, could be power tools, shop tools, things like that, that what are, what are needed by this enterprise in order to make it uh, successful or, or cut down on, on the labor hours. And then a lot of farmers don't think about this too much, but their thinking work, how much head work is needed um, for this enterprise. You know, uh, you're going to need some basic knowledge, some competencies in growing anything, whether it's a plant or animal or a service um, enterprise. Um, but you use your mind to, to think things through, to solve problems, um, also to manage people or, or, or the resources on the farm. So these two uh, also need to be considered. Another uh, category of consideration would be uh, what's needed or what's essential, what are the resources that are essential for this enterprise to be fruitful. Um, so whether it's a cow-calf operation or a uh, poultry operation or a fruit or a vegetable or, or a dried flower operation. You've got to think about what is going to be needed. So it's the land and the soil. Um, most farms are based on soil and so if you look at our country, um, you know, one reason why we've been so successful as a nation is because our, of our agriculture, our soil and natural resources. Um, the climate, what hardiness zone are you in? When, when does the growing season start? What are your frost-free growing dates? Uh, when do you have light enough to produce a crop? Um, that has to be considered. Uh, water, not only how much water, but the quality of the water too. So uh, if you're in the cheese making business, you're gonna, or any dairy business, you're gonna need a lot of water uh, for cleaning, uh, cooling, and things like that. If you're in um, a, a plant business, all life um, uh, requires water. And so that water quantity and quality is very important to think about 
uh, in the enterprise that you choose. You don't want to be cut short on your production because you lack the water um, to produce it. Um, resources of equipment and tools, we mentioned this in the machine part aspect of the operation, but what kind of equipment is going to be needed for you to be successful um, in producing, maintaining, or, or growing this business? Facilities, a lot of farmers um, you know, think about, I've got to have a barn, I've got to have a structure of some sort. There's lots of enterprises that don't require facilities, um, but uh, oftentimes facilities can help with equipment storage or um, product storage or uh, places to, to process that product. So facilities need to be considered as well. And then labor, what type of labor, how much labor, um, is it skilled, unskilled? Um, those kind of things. And, and lastly on my list, uh, what kind of startup cash, a resource of cash or capital is going to be important. Uh, what do I need to invest in so that I can uh, have this operation be successful? Another thing that uh, many people don't think about is the, the production cycle of an enterprise. So how long will it take from start to finish, from the day you sow that seed or pick up that day old chick or um, have lambs born on the farm, when, when will you harvest or uh, bring to market that final product? And so it might take days, like radishes take uh, well, about 28 to 30 days from seed to harvest. Uh, that's a pretty quick turnaround when it comes to agricultural production. Uh, or it might take weeks. Uh, uh, in the next uh, slide you'll see how I've broken down some livestock enterprises and the amount of weeks or months that it takes from day one to harvest date. But as you look at that enterprise production cycle, you're going to think about how long is it going to take before I get some money back on my investment. So some things will take more than a year. Um, you know, people that grow fruit, um, almost all fruit is perennial, uh, or at least can take two years. Uh, the year two is when you start picking. So that means you're not going to get any cash back in that first year uh, when you planted that strawberry uh, plant or or uh, asparagus crown or uh, plant that blue uh, blueberry plant or apple tree, it's going to take some time for that first fruit to come and the first harvest. As you, as you look at this slide here, you can see this is a breakdown of production cycles for some meat um, livestock species. This is live weight, so you can see uh, broilers will take about eight weeks, um, two months, uh, from the day you start that day old chick to the day you bring it to market, uh, have it processed or process, you process it yourself, it's pretty quick turnaround. That's about the same as zucchini when you think about it. When you plant your zucchini in uh, Memorial Day weekend, it's ready to pick uh, by the, the, the first part of July or the last part of June. So, you know, broilers grow pretty quickly. Rabbits too uh, convert feed very uh, efficiently. But as you look down that list, uh, you can see that their production cycle uh, is, increases um, by months, um, you know, turkeys and swine and lambs and goat kids, um, those are all doable within a grazing season. Uh, but as you take a look at beef cattle, or if you had buffalo or some other um, a dairy animal that you were trying to produce, these are all meat animals, but uh, you can see to get 1,100 pounds is going to take a lot more than four to eight weeks to get that animal to market weight. It's going to take a, over a year uh, to do that. Uh, so that production cycle is very important. Um, the next part to think about is your market. And this is probably the most important part of your whole selection. Uh, because if you don't have a market to sell to, um, then uh, you're not going to be last, you're not going to last very long as a farmer. Um, and what I often tell farmers is you want to have more than one market. That dependable market is essential, but you really want to have uh, plans for two or more markets so that if one falls through, you can still sell what you've grown. Because again, you took at least eight weeks in growing what you're trying to sell. Uh, it could be six months or eight months. So what you want to make sure is that market is dependable and it's ready to buy. Uh, another thing to think about as you consider an enterprise is the potential income that you'll generate, that you'll need to generate from that. You know, we talked about production cycle and selling things within a, a eight week period or two month period. Now that's rather short term, but that's pretty good. You know, when you think about cash flow, you want some money coming back to the farm, back into your pocket, uh, back for family living or um, 
investing back in the business. So that income could consider short term. You can think of a long term income, seasonal income or year round income, because some, some things like dairy farming, you're going to be milking cows every day. You're going to be having milk to sell every other day. The milk truck comes or you, you have something to sell every every day of the year. So that year round income is pretty nice. You also think about, you know, you might have that income coming in, but you also have expenses every day, too. So that has to be considered and uh, that potential income needs to be considered. Um, you see that last bullet there, targeted income. What I often do is ask farmers, what do you need to produce? What do you need to generate, not produce, but generate for income uh, in order to live comfortably? We don't want our farmers living like refugees. They need to be able to live, um, you know, without being hungry, without being uncomfortable. Um, and so whether it's $10,000 extra as a, a supplemental income to their uh, regular income, whether they work off the farm or off the ranch, or another member of the family works off the farm or off the ranch, you need to think how much do we need to make in order to make this thing work. Um, and so you can adjust your enterprise accordingly. That size and scale of the enterprise uh, will be uh, will come will be influenced by what what do you need to make. Uh, my next slide, you can see that uh, you know we're talking a little bit more about how much you want or need to generate. So um, you want to do more than just break even. That at least cover your expenses. But how much does your family need in additional income? Um, and then set that and work accordingly to it. So here's some sample. Um, these are not really gross incomes. This is net income. That was a, uh, my mistake in my slide. But uh, berry crops, whether it be strawberry, blueberry, or raspberries, and really we should start with zero, zero dollars because you could have crop failure. Uh, for some reason, but uh, typically a berry farmer uh, nets about four thousand to seven thousand dollars an acre um, from that crop. Tomatoes too are also that's a high cash crop. Um, you need to invest in each of these. You know these don't come from nothing. You need to be able to you know have the soil, the proper soil, the proper um, temperature, the, the best seed, the fertilizer, all the water, the, everything needed. And then harvesting. So there's a lot of expenses to get to that. You just don't pop the seed in the soil and expect that you're going to be pulling in thousands of dollars per acre. Um, but as you can see, that these net uh, incomes are, are just projections. You, you can, you know, uh, what a specialist told me that you start with zero, expect zero dollars to, like on the berry crop, seven thousand dollars. So zero to seven or zero to eight thousand. Uh, that's a big range. So you just need to realize that. Um, that uh, expected net income um, is really um, pretty variable. It depends on lots of different things. Um, what you to get these, you can go to uh, lots of different resources. I often use the Penn State uh, University's extension. Uh, they have a list of enterprise budgets. You can see there's the link at the bottom of the, of the uh, uh, slide. Um, but if you did a search uh, agriculture alternatives or alternative agriculture Pennsylvania, you'll get to the same thing. They're broken down not just by horticultural crops, but also by livestock and other uh, types of enterprise. So uh, this goes sort of back to our uh, menu analogy, but um, you could select an enterprise based on your likes and dislikes. What gives you enjoyment? Um, what are those rewards? Whether is it the money aspect or just like working with animals? Or um, do you have some resources on the farm that really uh, could be used uh, more effectively or efficiently. So you can see in the pictures here, some people love to be around flowers, while some people might love to be around animals. Um, these are middle white pigs. Um, they're pretty ugly pigs, but they're quite efficient, and they're, uh, uh, they do well in certain environments. So, but people will choose an enterprise based on their what, what they like. Now, all these uh, considerations that we thought about, you know, from the money aspect to the size aspect to um, different uh, ways to look at an enterprise, they're all going to uh, involve some risk. So the farmer or rancher needs to identify those risks. You know, what are they? How, uh, uh, how much money am I risking? Um, how important is the timing involved with my crop? You can see in this picture some uh, farmers in Maine using a really old style of hay with loose hay gathering with horses. Um, but they're risking something in that, you know, hay, making hay, you've got to have it, at least in New England, you've got to have three good days of dry weather. Um, 
uh, with either wind or, or sunshine to make hay. And so the risk are you could lose a crop by the rain, rains or uh, just some fog or, or some bad weather, um, or it, it will really diminish the value of the crop. So you've got to think about the risk that, um, that you're at the face with every crop, whether it's an animal crop, a plant crop. Um, service crops might be a little less risk, but still uh, there's risk involved there too. So one way to address risk is to try to reduce them or minimize them. And the way to do that is you can have more than one enterprise, um, what they call a complementary enterprise or supplementary enterprise. Um, but having more than one, you're, you're, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You've heard that uh, saying before. Well, that, that just goes to show that you need to spread out your risk. And so you want to have more than one enterprise. And for each enterprise, enterprise you want to have more than one market outlet. You want to start off small and expand with success, and you want to select a sure bet enterprise. Um, and some of you may say to yourself, what's a sure bet? Uh, well, sure bets are different for different people, but because of the resources that you have on your farm or ranch, you could um, uh, base your enterprise on what you do best. There's a reason why um, you know, soybeans are grown in certain parts of the country. Uh, we have a tough time growing soybeans in Maine. We can't grow. Uh, pecans in Maine. They can grow uh, peanuts in uh, the south, but we would have a tough time doing that here in Maine. So our climate, our soil, our, uh, all that comes into play in selecting uh, an enterprise. So uh, you want to select enterprises that complement each other, that don't compete for the same resources. You can see on this uh, slide that um, you can make your year into four quarters, the four seasons, or by the month. And every month there's something different going on the farm. What a lot of farmers like to have is being able to sell something in every season. So they have some cash flow coming in. Um, but those, those enterprises are going to compete for resources such as space, you know, whether it's facility space or land, how much land is needed. So if you have um, animals that graze, uh, that, that land can't be used for vegetables. Um, so what you want to think about is what, what land on my property or uh, what would be suitable for grazing, what would be suitable for vegetable production or flower production or grain production. But uh, space and land, labor is another uh, resource that uh, enterprise compete for. Um, how much time is it going to take to, to grow or uh, uh, develop this crop? Uh, equipment, you know, uh, there's a, a comp competition for equipment, whether it's tractors or, or uh, wagons or trucks or whatever. Um, how much management is going to be involved? Uh, not the manual labor part, but the thinking part of it. You know, how much management uh, are we competing for the management time? And there, there are probably others too out there, but this is just a short list of when you select enterprises, you want them to complement or agree with each other so that you're not competing for the same resources. And spreading out that risk, spreading out um, the uh, competition so that uh, or reducing the competition. So here um, I want some input from you all now in the chat box, but we're, we'll just take a look at this one picture and type in the enterprises that you see on this one farm. Look uh, high, look low, look deep in the background, but uh, tell me what you see in this, uh, this one picture of the enterprises on this farm. Okay, there's a chicken enterprise. It's a, these are laying hens. Um, they don't look like broilers to me from this uh, vantage point, uh, an eggmobile. There's some forest in the back, so firewood or lumber perhaps. There's uh, hair sheep or there's some sheep. You probably couldn't tell they're hair sheep, but uh, because I know the farm, I know that they're hair sheep, but the sheep are in the background too. Um, you can see that in back of the uh, eggmobile here, there's some two contraptions where bales of hay are thrown up in, so hay uh, could be, uh, the, the cribs there could be um, selling hay as a cash crop in a lot of farms. Um, also, you see some tilled soil, so those garden crops or row crops, vegetables. This happens to be a um, organic vegetable farm that's a CSA. They do sell eggs and, and lamb on the side, uh, but a uh, great uh, 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 way to look at this picture, everybody. Thanks for your input on this. So. You can see on this farm, there's several enterprises on the farm, um, not just one, but he's, 
he and his family has spread out the, the risk. Um, and you can see that there is some competition, though, that tilled soil could have been pasture, but if it was pasture and the land crop fails, then, then, um, uh, then you're out. So he's spread the risk. Ah, somebody else mentioned, you see some people in the background, yeah, walking trails. So agritourism is another um, component of, of this farm. People come just to spend time to be around the farm, but also they walk through the woods. So great, great observations, everybody. We're going to the next picture now. So um, now we're going to sort of get down a little closer to what we really want to learn today is the consideration of the enterprise uh, by demand on the limitations. So we work with audiences of, that vary in abilities and their limitations, but everybody has limitations. Um, if you walk up to anybody on the street or in the store and you start talking with them, you can soon find out that we're all limited in some way, uh, whether it's uh, stature or um, abilities um, or intelligence or or um, uh, just you know, our strength. So you can see that as you look at enterprise, you want to uh, pick an enterprise that considers our own abilities. Uh, that farmer or rancher's abilities and his or her limitations as well. You want to identify the demands of the enterprise on those on that person. You know when when are the highest demands? What are they? When do they take place? And how much how much of a demand is it going to be? So in addressing the demands, you want to think about you know can I hire somebody else? Um, do I have to do everything, or are there other members of my family that do some can perform some of the jobs? Or should I hire somebody that has the skills or do you need to train people to in order to pick or, or operate a tractor or, or help with lambing time or pick apples or, or things like that. So you want to adjust your um, enterprise that you, you have to consider that you have to have labor and labor, whether it's going to be you or somebody else, um, it's going to have to harvest that crop or, or perform some of the things that that crop or, or enterprise needs for success. Uh, we can use machinery or equipment in much of agriculture. And when you look at back at our history of our country and and how uh, uh, the, you know machinery has taken over a lot of uh, aspects, a lot of tasks, a lot of jobs on the farm, um, things have changed quite a bit. And uh, and then finally with assistive technology, with with the audiences we work with and the client um, groups we work with, um, you know, assistive technology is a very important aspect. So a lot of times people don't even know about uh, the technology that's available for them as a farmer or a rancher. So some of the sources for informational assistance, um, you know, because we all are familiar with agribility, um, we, we know that uh, what, what's available. But uh, somebody from the outside might even not might even not might not be familiar with agribility. So agribility is a, is a great resource. For informational assistance, um, extension uh, is in every state, and uh, there's a, you know extension offices in most every county in in the country. USDA service centers, the small business development centers uh, around the, the states and regions and, and across the country. ATRA um, is appropriate transfer technology transfer to rural areas. It's a U.S. government funded. It's, I think it's Department of Interior that runs it, but they do a lot around. Um, uh, sustainable agriculture. And if you don't know about ATRA, uh, just Google that and you'll find out um, what they have available to farmers and um, people that help farmers, farm advisors. There's lots of non-governmental uh, organizations in every state too that address farm related issues and they could be a place for information. And then I always point people to other farmers and uh, people that are producing uh, foods um, or fiber and these are all um, great places to get uh, some additional resources. Um, many of us know about the toolbox, but how many of us have really gone into it and searched it and looked for things? But um, you can see the uh, link on the bottom. But I'd really encourage each of us to get into the toolbox and, and see what's there. And if, if you come across things that aren't there, to, to add to it. Um, this is one of the neatest things about agribility is the networking. And so um, as you help farmers um, with uh, addressing uh, selection or evaluation of an enterprise, then that toolbox is going to be very handy.
And then I often use, um, uh, USDA has a really nice list, but I, if a farmer or calls me up and wants to know, what do I grow? I put it back in their, on, their, in, on their shoulders saying, well, what you need to do is sit with your family and just start making a list of things that you think would fit on the farm. Um, this web link that I given here um, is just a list of alternative enterprises, uh, land-based enterprises, uh, some water-based enterprises too, that a farmer or a rancher uh, might want to consider. Now, some things won't fit because of hardiness zones or, or not the correct resources, but uh, it's probably a list of 200 different um, enterprises that to think about. All of it's just names, it's not any description. So uh, the first step for a farm or ranch family is to go through the list and just start marking things that they feel might be um, feasible for them. Once they pick those, then they start doing some research, and that's where Extension or USDA or AgriBility comes in with helping to fill that um, information um, so that they, they can continue to learn and grow and see what would be feasible. I always suggest that farmers and ranchers um, make the mistakes on paper first. Don't be invested and say, I, I want to get into goats, and they go out and buy a bunch of goats and then figure out, wait a minute, this is not what I'm really expecting. So, um, so what I always encourage farmers and ranchers to do is to pick out some enterprises, do the research, make you know, push that pencil and see what's a, a feasible um, enterprise. Is this feasible for me, my family, my situation, and is there room for expansion, um, uh, or is it room for success? That's the first step. So um, that listing uh, there would be uh, a good one to go to. But if you just Googled um, USDA um, alternative enterprises, you'd probably come up with that list as well, that same link. Um, we mentioned in the very first, uh, one of the first slides is that, um, you know, you animal-based, plant-based, or service-based. And agritourism is a huge, um, there's huge interest in that across the country because people are driven uh, for local foods. They love to see where their food is grown, whether it's animal or plant. Um, they also love to come to visit farms. And so um, Agri uh, Rutgers University has, has put together a really nice website that's really designed for farmers. Um, there's some uh, learning videos, there's some uh, uh, learning modules or training modules. There's lots of fact sheets and lots of helps, but this uh, would be really helpful. Uh, it sort of looks at, uh, presents to the farmer or rancher the real world aspect of agritourism. It's not just, uh, you know, fun and games, but you've got to make sure that you have everything is safe and secure for people to come on your property. You've got to make sure you're insured. But this site would be a very good site for, for anybody to go to to um, think about or, or, can, or to learn about agritourism. So other possible resources I've listed here, but I would also invite each of you to uh, maybe list some resources that you found helpful in helping farmers or ranches um, either select an enterprise or evaluate an enterprise. So we're looking for other possible resources, whether it's web links or names of organizations that help farmers, books perhaps. See several people are typing, we'll wait till some things come up. So SARE, um, every state has a SARE um, point person uh, that's divided up into regions, but SARE is a good place to look for information. Uh, you can go online and search what kind of information is up online too. Small Business Administration, yeah. A local commodity group, so like in Maine we have a blueberry commission, a potato uh, board, um, a small fruit and vegetable growers association. Um, so yeah, look for those commodity groups and get information that way. Um, in Missouri, small farm family programs. Uh, sometimes um, you can search just small farm and then your state and see what comes up and you might come across some really good programs that are available to either small farm, small ranch,
So remember, just like when we were picking our menu uh, meal off the menu, um, you you want to you are the driver. So um, I'll go back to some notes here in a bit, but I finish up here with this thought that you, as the farmer or the rancher, are the driver. Um, they are the ones that will gather information. They're the ones that can identify the markets. They're the ones that think things through um, and develop a plan, implement the plan, measure the results, and adjust to optimize that result. So usually you, um, you're, you're gonna, it's going to take some time. And so by keeping records and keeping notes, you're going to make the best decisions. Um, We'll go back to the chat box here. You can see that yeah, the 1890 schools are also excellent resources. So as if you've got 1890 schools in your state, um, they typically focus on, those institutions typically focus on small scale agriculture um, and that they are all would be a good place. And even if you don't have one in your state, you can still correspond or communicate with ones in other parts of the country. Uh, so whether it be uh, fruit or vegetable crops, or small room at crops. So what I'd like to do is open it up for some other ideas. You know, um, as you look at this uh, presentation and think about what I presented today, you know, this could be anybody, whether it be an able-bodied person or somebody with limitations, physically or um, cognitive limitations. That, you know, we we look at things in a in a a, a planned approach or organized approach, um, but that that disability or chronic illness or limitation that a person has is going to have to be considered in selecting an enterprise. So I noticed a note about um, occupational therapists and physical therapists. You know, those people are going to be very helpful in what, what's feasible. So um, I'd like to just sort of open up. I'm going to give a scenario and I want you to respond um, with the type of enterprise you think that will be fitting for this type of person. Okay, so I've got an older person who is retired um, from not, he was not a farmer uh, in uh, his work, working life, uh, his, uh, but now that he's retired, he's 65 plus years old, but he's got a bad back, but he lives in, he, he moved to the country with his wife and they want to use the farm. They've got some grandchildren that they need to take care of and they want to um, have a farm uh, in order to pay the taxes and make, make a living because they uh, don't have enough income for themselves and their grandchildren to live. So a person, an older person with a back problem. So what would be uh, uh, some possible um, enterprises that this person might consider? Okay, the question, how much land? Let's say he's got 25 acres, which isn't huge, but it's pretty good size for, for it depends on where you're at. Cut your own Christmas trees, yeah. So on a Christmas tree operation, you don't have to have a whole lot of back work. Bees, turkeys, hops. Hey. Uh, good question. What are their financial resources? Well, um, it sounds like, uh, you know, they, they are older. They might have some money come in retirement, but it also sounds like they don't have enough to really um, um, do what they want to do because of their responsibilities uh, with their grandchildren. So you can see that we've got a whole range of things. There's lots of things to consider, not just the back injury, but you know the financial aspect, the amount of land that they have available to them, whether they rent or own that land. Uh, so every uh, client that you work with is going to have a whole set of needs and a whole set of um, uh, attributes or characteristics that you have to address and help them address. Um, some things may be out of the question. Let's let's uh, let's turn it around and say, what crop, what uh, crops or agricultural enterprise uh, might this person not want to get into? Being 65 with a very bad back. Yeah, large animals. I mean, when you think about it, uh, whether it's cat, uh, cattle, uh, beef cattle, or dairy cattle, um, things that's going to take some some doing, um, handling, uh, they might want to stay away from that. 
um, it's going to take a bigger investment too. When you, it seems like the larger the animal you have, the bigger investment you have, not just by the animal, but also by the equipment you're going to need, whether it's feed or um, um, you know feeding equipment, storage, um, all, all that. So um, if you want to, we can take a look. Let, let me, um, uh, does somebody have a, a scenario that you'd like to present to the others to, to uh, address and, and maybe uh, give uh, give a background, a quick background of what you think, um, uh, you know, what the situation is, and then how, what enterprises would you choose or would you sort of point them to? Um, I would suggest you don't tell them what to do, but give sort of a menu of things that could be feasible. Good point, Gail, on, um, on the, on the um, cattle. You need somebody to, to, to for, um, for trimming, because you, you, you've got to uh, shear, shear the trees in order to make them the right shape. Just a reminder, if somebody would like to uh, enter in verbally, please just raise your hand if you'd like to state your scenario or give some ideas. It might be easier than typing. If you've got a scenario, a real-world scenario that you're trying to help somebody with now. Okay, um, Lonnie is in the same town of, as I am. She's in a different facility. So Lonnie, if you want to explain, you don't have to give, I don't want you to give anybody's name, um, but if you want to raise your hand, Paul will give you, uh, I'm not sure if you have a, a microphone where you're at though, so I don't know if that'll do. Um, but uh, sir, this person has early onset of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis and they have social security income, disability income. So what, what would be feasible for this person to, to uh, be involved with um, as an enterprise? Okay, the person also uh, gets tired very quickly. This farmer, uh, this individual gets tired very quickly. Um, balance and mobility could be issues. Right now, they're currently doing beef and vegetables. So this person with MS on Social Security Disability who gets tired and lacks balance and mobility Does the person walk or use a wheelchair, Lonnie? Gail, is, Gail from Vermont is suggesting an agritourism enterprise, perhaps a pick your own or a, a, a touring type of uh, enterprise, an educational enterprise. Uh, Sherry and Chris are saying, do they have a dog to help with the cattle with herding? Karen from Missouri is saying, how about a UPIC operation where you don't have a, the labor are your customers? Okay, back to Lonnie. She's given some more information. This uh, situation, the people love horses. They have horses. They've had them. Um, and they, they walk, but they have some balance issues. So right now, they're using ski poles around the farm, and they also have a mule. I guess that's for a work, a work animal. So Clifford is saying, how about a horse riding business? Would that be, since they love horses, that might be a possible service, um, could be a, a riding stable. Uh, Ray is suggesting hay rides or pumpkin picking, another uh, you pick operation. Oh, back to Lonnie, she's clarifying, it's not a regular mule, it's a motorized mule, like a, uh, a gator, John Deere gator, or a, this is a Yamaha product, I think. Um, so mule uh, ATV. Horse motel, Galen, great idea. People are willing to pay, you know, they might not have space for a horse, but they, their kids want horses, and so they would pay a fee to keep them someplace. Maybe a more focused operation, like a greenhouse or raised beds, where not so much mobility is needed. So uh, something that's concentrated, um, a raised bed, so if they're they're not in a wheelchair now, but they may be in a wheelchair in the future with this uh, disease. 
Any other ideas? Okay. Does somebody have another? Well, let's see. Candy's typing something. Let's see. In the meantime, if you've got another uh, scenario you'd like for people to think about and maybe give you ideas. Really appreciate everyone's input on this. It's uh, when you think about the technology, what we can do today of uh, networking and getting ideas and sharing ideas, that's great. I really appreciate your ability uh, for them to coordinate this type of uh, networking. Okay, Candy uh, is saying, um, could I have you backtrack a little regarding the multiple enterprises? Um, book we have requires a client to focus on one enterprise. How do you suggest we assist the client in addressing approaching this concern? Yeah, um, so a funding agency is saying focus on one. That might be um, because they don't want them too spread out. But when you do focus on one, um, you do run the risk. Your risks are higher. And so uh, uh, that's why I mentioned the complemental, uh, complementary enterprises. Um, and sometimes it, it doesn't have to be huge. It might be, um, you know, worm composting with a vegetable. Um, enterprise so that you're um, you can be selling worms or selling compost or as long you know as long as well as the vegetable crop so I I think a lot of times people think well farming is the enterprise well it, you know farming is is the is the business is the operation but even say take a dairy farmer um, he or she has the dairy cattle so they're selling milk they might sell manure that could be another part of the enterprise. They might sell hay. Uh, they might sell young stock. They might sell um, uh, embryos. Uh, so there's lots of different things that come from the farm um, uh, that they could that really could be considered a different enterprise. Um, and, and what you want to do is measure that. So Lonnie suggests also uh, just put, pointing out that seasonal enterprises are acceptable in Maine by the BR. So I think sometimes we just need to work with with our um, VR to to sort of explain farming a little more deeper and to help them realize that you know even though uh, it may be uh, two enterprises or three enterprises they sort of fit together as one operation. So here's here's a um, Here's a scenario from uh, Rick in Wyoming. Um, a female uh, who was partially paralyzed in a horse accident can walk, but with difficulty. Tried raising chickens, but the coyotes and dogs got them. Um, has horses in Wyoming, so any crops need to be irrigated. So um, it's a ranch operation, but very small. She has a few horses. so. Uh, just from the information you have from Rick, uh, this woman in Wyoming, what would you suggest? Um, sounds like vegetables are, uh, are not part of the, couldn't be part of the plan. It has to be something different. Gail from Vermont is typing, I see. And Karen, too. Let's see what we have some some ideas for Rick in Wyoming. Rick did go. I remember seeing this. She had tips on how to get back her how to get her so she can get back on her horses um, without the difficulty, and that she he got some good input. So uh, Karen's asking how many acres and what financial risk resources does this woman have in Wyoming. So Gail's pointing out that uh, Wyoming would have a pretty, a pretty short growing season. About 40 acres um, is the size of the farm. It sounds like because she likes horses and knows horses, that horses ought to be 
a part of her enterprise. Um, I mean, she's got all that knowledge, all that experience. Ah, Lonnie saying equine therapy. Um, riding lessons, Sherry and Chris. Uh, but need an indoor arena. It could be a seasonal thing. Uh, could be um, uh, horse, you know, uh, trails. That could be something, not lessons, but trail riding. So around the agritours in part. She did have some high school boys come out to help with work and they got hooked riding her horses. So maybe extend to other youth. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of kids don't have that opportunity. So that whether it's, uh, you know, week long horse camps or month long horse camps, it's just ways to teach kids about horse science, about animal science, about horses. It'd be really good. I think that would be a really interesting um, enterprise for her and she'd feel right at home and she could control how many clients she could have. So Karen's saying uh, perhaps a 4-H program. So thank you everybody for um, chiming in and um, sharing your thoughts on, on these scenarios. Uh, you can see that it, it's okay to put word out to others and say, what, you know, have anybody got any ideas on this? Um, the, the, the bottom line though is really thinking about what can that farmer or rancher do um, with with some help perhaps, with some assistive technology, with some extra labor, um, what's feasible for them, uh, for them to be able to generate some income um, to, um, to uh, have this enterprise work. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul. Richard, thanks very much for an excellent session. I think that's probably the most interactive webinar we've ever had. So it um, gives us some ideas for the future in terms of doing something similar. While everybody's still on, I'd like to get some feedback, both in terms of the poll questions and uh, also throw out some ideas for you for the future, since this is our last session of the, the web conference. So again, as usual, the same poll questions as always. If you could just tell us what your affiliation is. Okay, thank you for your input there. Bye back down a little bit. Okay. Next question asks about the information that was shared today. Did you find the information in the session to be valuable? Did it meet your expectations? Okay, thank you for your input. Technology, was it usable for you? Did you find it to be effective today? We stretched it a little bit in terms of the amount of interactivity, so hopefully that was a good experience for you. And if you did have any specifics in terms of problems, if you could let us know in the chat window, we'd appreciate that. Also, if anybody has any other questions, we still will entertain those if um, 
you have a, one you would like to specifically ask to Richard, we can do that. And then finally, our last poll question. Even though we don't have any other sessions in this conference, based on today's session, would you attend another session in this series? Excuse me, my microphone was not on. Um, before we leave, uh, just a couple of things about uh, upcoming webinars, since this is the last session in our virtual conference for this year. If you have specific ideas in terms of sessions you would like to see, uh, if you would like to see um, more sessions like this that were interactive where you can share particular needs or client situations and get some online feedback, please let us know. If you would personally like to present a, a session, as I indicated before, this particular web conference centered around sessions that were popular during the Minnesota NTW. If there are ones that uh, you would like to present yourself, please let me know. If you like this format of uh, kind of redoing some of the greatest hits of the previous NTW. We would like to uh, know that. Or if you, um, even to the point of, do we keep uh, doing this particular web conference? And that, again, will be a question that we ask on our annual staff needs assessment. Um, obviously, with today's session, we, we have the opportunity to do some types of uh, almost unconferencing sessions. So. That's an idea to consider, and uh, we're definitely open to those possibilities. I am not seeing particular uh, questions at this point. It looks like everybody felt like, like this was a good session, and I'm sure Richard would be glad to ask, answer specific questions if you have any of those later and would like to email him. So. Um, at this point, I want to just thank everybody for participating. I want to especially thank uh, Kate Ham and Cliff Raz on our staff for helping to facilitate these. Um, we didn't have major technical difficulties, but that doesn't mean it's an easy process. So I appreciate everybody's help in doing this. And uh, so with that, I think we will bid you a good afternoon. Don't forget the all staff call next Tuesday. And uh, we hope everybody has a good Christmas and New Year's, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.